You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No more hangers. Welcome to a very special Vintage Video Patreon pick, where our patrons at the $100 tier are invited to request any pre-80s title they'd like for a custom review from the Vintage Video team. Overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today, VJ Boyd has asked us to review Hot Rods to Hell, released January 27th, 1967. It was written by Robert E. Kent, based on a story by Alex Gaby, directed by John Bram, and released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Story credit E, Alex Gaby, wrote a short story called The Red Car, which was later published in the Saturday Evening Post with the title 52 Miles to Terror. In 1955, MGM bought the rights to the story and attached Rod Serling to adapt the story to a script, but in March of 56, the project floundered and was shelved. A decade later, in 1966, the project was resurrected as a TV movie with the same 52 Miles to Terror working title, but the finished product was deemed by MGM to be too intense for television viewers, and it was instead booked into theaters and drive-in circuits, where they hoped it would profit from the popularity of earlier films like Blackboard Jungle. This was too intense for television. Yeah, way too intense. Oh my goodness. You see that bloody hand in one scene? Yeah. It turned a decent profit, but was derided by critics. In the years since its initial release, it has developed a cult following on account of its TV-style melodramatic performances presented cinematically. See, yeah, like I could, I could see it as as television, but what I thought it was was more like, um, like a PSA. Mm -hmm, like sure. it, it felt like you know the the don't do drugs kids kind of thing. Like don't yeah, drive after fast. school special type thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, especially with the ending, with like the the kind of just. Well, we'll get into the ending when we get to the sure. ending. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely felt like almost like propaganda. Yeah, like or... government sponsored messaging. Yeah. It, yeah. What it was the uh, reefer madness. It's very, you know, yeah, it's, like it's a, a full, subtler reefer madness. It's a full on like movie dedicated to convincing people not to drive crazy. Yeah, because at the time, speed limits were relatively new and. People were very upset about them when they were established, understandably, because it's like, yeah. I used to be able to drive whatever speed my car went, and now <laughs> I have to go the speed that you said on a road randomly? It's like, oh, it's not random. People die in these accidents. Yeah. Well, it's but like, I would be annoyed if I had to go 55, too. Yeah, yeah me too. Or <laughs> 30, as well, the case may be. Yeah, it was like, we're only going 55? That's fast enough. Like, the like, is it, though? <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, from the credited writers, this is not the Rod Serling script. Correct, yeah. I want to know what Rod Serling wrote. Well, at the end, uh, the car breaks down and he's like, no, there was time now. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It became the first film of an unofficial quadrology of films followed by Hot Rod, Hot Rod Gang, and Hot Rod Girl, which are all basically drag racing PSAs, though the kids are only villains in this first film. The rest yeah. of them, they're the protagonists of the story. It was shot in 4.3 and later cropped into a 185 frame for home video release. <laughs> Great. So, so it's like, remember when we worked at Blockbuster and people would complain that the picture was cropped and we had to mm -hmm. explain, no, 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 this is the full format. What you're normally seeing is cropped. This is the opposite of that. <laughs> they took the 4.3 that they shot and they just tried to cut it as nicely as they could into rectangles. I, I can't remember which DVD it is that I own, but it's... The I, I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, it's it's a four by three of a widescreen. So there's black bars on the sides and black bars on the top and bottom. <laughs> yeah. So it exists just in the centers of the screen, but super tiny. T tell me that it also required pan and scan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing that uh, butterfly meme, and you're just saying, "Is this picture in picture?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, yes. <laughs> We start the film with the beginning of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, two hot rods overloaded with teenagers racing through the Southern California desert. They start challenging other civilian vehicles on the road. No government jeeps this time, though. No undercover Russians. Mm. When the other cars part ways, the hot rods swerve dangerously at each other, and it's clear these are skilled drivers and fearless passengers. The girl riding on the roll bar, who we'll come to know as Gloria, doesn't seem spooked at all by the danger. We dip to black and come back up in a Norman Rockwell home at Christmas time. A young boy, Jamie Phillips, is wearing a Santa beard and races across the den from a decorated Christmas tree to a ringing phone before his sister Tina can answer it. 
He answers, pretending to be a butler, but gives up the character when he hears his father's voice. Hey, it's Dad! Where is he? Where are you? Apparently, he's on a work trip, and both kids ask about the gifts they're expecting for Christmas. Tina wants some lace pajamas, which she describes as kicky, but I definitely heard kinky on the first pass, yeah. oh. and I had to back it up. Dad, Tina, those pajamas, the real kicky ones with the lace, the ones I told you about. Uh, all that lace, you might catch cold. Wait, really? She says kicky. She's... Okay, because I think I even turned on the subtitles, and I think it said It kinky. says kicky in oh, the subtitles. Kinky? Okay, then I yeah. read what I wanted to read. Uh, <laughs> she yeah. asked her dad for kinky pajamas. Can I get some yeah. kinky pajamas? <laughs> but the way she answers the phone here, too, is crazy. So her brother answers the phone, and then she takes the phone away from him and is like, Hi, Dad, Tina. Like, you yeah. only have two children. I yeah. think yeah. he would know when I'm you- not mom. <laughs> but you just called him Dad. I think he knows who you <laughs> <Yeah>. are. <laughs> Dad says he'll be home for dinner tonight, and Jamie puts the beard on Tina. Mom, if Tina wears that beard, can she be my brother? Oh, you do. <laughs> I actually got really invested. Like, I bet he got her the pajamas she wanted, and and he's mm. pretending that he's being too conservative, and we're going to have this cute scene where she opens it up and she got what she asked for. No, we're never going to touch on these I, gifts again. I really wanted her to get kinky pajamas yeah. instead. I'm sorry, the phone connection... <laughs> <laughs> this is very strange. It's the 60s, you know. <laughs> He's just at like a lingerie store. They're for my daughter. Are these kinky enough? <laughs> are you sure that's what she said? The I'm subtitles pretty... say kicky. <laughs> How are you reading the subtitles on my phone calls with my daughter? So at this point, I wasn't. I, I didn't know anything about this movie yeah. going in. Uh, so I didn't know what was going to be this big twist or setup. You know, I didn't know if there was. Gonna I knew be... something was going to happen because VJ picked it out for us, and yeah. I was like, "There has to be a reason. This isn't just a normal Christmas movie." But but the next scene sets a tone <laughs> that I was like, "Well, hold on, are we going to come back to that?" Yeah. We cut away to Dad's drive home, intercut with a reckless driver swerving all over the road. Eventually, the two cars collide, and we see Dad's car overturned on the side of the road, and Dad splayed out in the dirt with a head injury amongst a sprinkling of presents. So before that, though, he's listening to the radio and there's Christmas music and it's interrupted with a news broadcast and it's going on about like normal. And then it's a, then it starts. He's like getting bored with the news. So he's about to change it. And, it's just, and while we have no official figures as yet from the National Safety Council concerning the mounting death toll. And, and he quits his right. I was like, whoa, what? What death toll? <laughs> what de- what's happening? That, they cover that in the second pandemic. movie. pandemic. I yeah. don't know if you knew this. That, that's what I thought the twist was. I thought the twist was going to be like this, like there's actually like some like apocalyptic thing happening. <laughs> and it probably didn't help that the file that I got for this movie said that it was three hours long. <laughs> so you were like 10 minutes from the end. You're like, where are those zombies? <laughs> We hard cut to the Commonwealth General Hospital where we see Dad wheeled out of surgery. The surgeon informs Peg and the kids that Dad's going to make it, and without any expected paralysis, though he will need to wear a brace for some time. The family are understandably grateful. Peg thinks to call her brother-in-law Bill from California to let him know what's happened, and we cut to Bill arriving to assist with his brother Tom's discharge from the hospital. It sounds like they've made some plans together, and they're nervous to share them with Tom. Tina doesn't even seem totally on board with them. Well, it's been two months. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, time has moved forward quite a bit. Peg tells Bill that she hasn't discussed the plans with Tom because he's been a very frightened man since the accident. I thought for sure the plans were that... Those two are getting together? Yeah. Yeah, I thought they were hooking up, too. Have you talked to uh, my brother about the fact that we're uh, shacking up? (laughs) No. (laughs) He's so scared lately. (laughs) That night at the house, they reveal their plan. In place of all the traveling work that he's had to do, they found a motel for sale in California. Although, according to the sales flyer, the property is located at the junction of highways 93 and 66, which actually puts it in Kingman, Arizona. 93 never even touches California. Tom is very uncomfortable with the plan. Certain he can't afford it, but his brother insists that he's worked out all the finances, and Tom's doctor thinks the desert heat will be helpful to Tom's recovery. That's a very 60s diagnosis. Yeah. (laughs) It's just like, just stand in the desert, that'll fix your broken back. Bill has checked the investment from every angle, and he will cover some of the cost with a $5,000 loan. That night, Tom has another nightmare about the crash and thinks getting away from here might not be a terrible idea after all. We cut right to them driving through the desert the next day, and we see more of the same teens racing their hot rods in the dirt roads. Gloria leans on the roll bar over the back seat of a red 58 Corvette and screams orgasmically for her boyfriend Duke driving to drive faster and more dangerously. Yeah, she wants the, she wants him to run the other car off the road. Right. 
Run him off the road, Duke! Run him off the road! The two hot rods don't even see the Phillips family coming, and Peg has to swerve off the road to avoid an accident. Tom is sweating all over and furious. Tina seems to think it's just a thing kids do and not that big a deal. And Jamie acts really mad about how crazy Gloria looked because he doesn't understand his new feelings. Peg thinks they should take this opportunity to do exercises on the side of the road. Dr. Rosen said every four hours. Really? <laughs> every four hours I have to get out of an exercise in the desert? <laughs> Tom thinks a psychiatrist might be in order, but Peg's a boomer and she'll be damned if her husband's going to waste any time seeing a shrink. She even offers him the steering wheel for the next stretch, but he's not ready for it. <laughs> I think he says the steering wheel winked at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the steering wheel winked at you? <laughs> he goes to play football with Jamie on the side of the road for a bit when the teams come speeding by again, and Gloria throws a full beer can at the boy's head and narrowly misses him. And it's like a, a, like a big can. Yeah, it's a tall boy for sure. <laughs> and so is the can. <laughs> <laughs> he's a short boy, actually, but not the can. All girls are nuts. She could have knocked my brains out. What kind of animals are those? Duke pulls the Corvette up to some desert rock piles like the ones in Tremors and tells his friend Ernie in the passenger seat to get lost while he has sex with Gloria on dirt and rocks. <laughs> How about in the car, guys? <laughs> yeah. There's a car here. And why does if they're going to do it on the rocks, why does why does Ernie need to leave? Yeah. Just, I'll just wait in the car. <laughs> yeah, and if you want the car, I'll wait on the rocks. <laughs> Get my rocks off while you get on those rocks. <laughs> Ernie walks miles through the desert to get to the nearest gas station. When the Phillips family get back on the road, they suddenly have a flat, and seconds later the flat explodes somehow. I don't understand. If it was already flat, it shouldn't have erupted like this. Unless there was a bomb inside of it. Tom grabs the wheel to wrench the car to the side of the road, and Peg asks him to please never do that again. At the gas station, Ernie shows up, and the attendant, Charlie, is already tired of his shit. Ernie says he needs 10 gallons and offers to drink them before gesturing to a drinking fountain. Wise guy, kids. The Phillips family rumbles up to the gas station and attendant Charlie offers to swap their flat for a spare. Ernie takes notice of teenage Tina with her family and Tom somehow recognizes Ernie out of the car. You're one of the boys that was in that red car. Oh yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, yeah, that Gloria's a kook. She's always throwing things out. Someday she's gonna hit somebody. The way you kids drive, that car's gonna hit somebody. Ernie's had enough of the lecture and collects an 18-inch wrench to threaten Tom with. Charlie notices the commotion and takes it away from the kid. He tells Tom that Duke and Ernie have rich parents who buy them whatever they want, but kids don't know what they want. We cut back to the rocks where Duke and Gloria are redressing, and she is complaining that there's nothing to do in this desert town that they haven't already done. He's like, except for that one thing, and she's like, I said no! <laughs> When Tom shares with Charlie that the family is headed 52 miles to Mayville, California to take over a motel, the man knows the exact one. You bought dailies? How did you know it was dailies? There ain't no other motel in Mayville. Daly never told anybody he was selling out. Both Ernie and Charlie seem disappointed by the news. We, like, Charlie's, like, almost, like, stunned. Like, yeah. what? We'll learn later it's because both of these people are swingers. <laughs> Why is Charlie so upset about it? <laughs> I think that it wasn't clear to me, you know, for a while here until they actually get there, that it's more than just a hotel. Right. It's yeah. like a it's a hangout place. It's a dance. <laughs> but it doesn't hall. seem like Charlie's scene. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Maybe I underestimate him. Ernie breaks the news to Duke and Gloria, and for some reason they give a shit about who owns the local hotel. He owns Daly's now. He bought the place. Wait a minute. You're out of your mind. Look, I tell you, he's on his way to Mayville now. Look, you better not be putting us on. Look, what do you think, I'm crazy? Duke uses a nearby payphone to call some friends to help harass this family. On the road to Mayville, the Phillips are quickly being tailgated by Duke. They honk a lot, and Tom tries waving them around, but they don't take it. Over the course of the film, Tom finds himself in this position many times, yeah. and the obvious and correct solution is to slow down and let them pass, but he just never even considers it. Peg suggests it every time, and he always has a dumb excuse not to, even when the hot rod pulls up alongside their car and nearly veers into them. Slow down. Make him pass you. I think it's passed now. They were going. It's like, just slow down. Just yeah. stop your car, and they'll go by. I feel like at one point he was he was saying, like, you know, that the, they would also stop and then they'd be in trouble or something. But, like, like I'm like, what? Are, what, are these teenagers going to yeah. get out of their car, follow you, and beat you up or yeah, something? They like, literally what, are what only... What is going to happen? They just want to torment you in the car. Yeah, they can't threaten you without their cars. 
Then he starts honking at them to antagonize the teens inexplicably, and we randomly fade from the middle of the action to both cars slowly moving through a town. Yeah. <laughs> like, the speed drops 20 miles per hour, and both cars are just moving at regular traffic speed down a road. Tom stops for a red light, and Duke blows it, but backs up to be next to Tom again. The boys whistle at Tina, and she is super hot for it. The light turns green again, and Tom decides now is the time to let Duke pass him, mm -hmm. so he sits at the green light till a trail of cars start honking incessantly behind him. Eventually, the honking gets to him, and Tom blasts through the intersection and nearly hits a truck as it pulls out onto the road. A block later, the chase is back on, and again, Peg asks Tom to just stop. Easy peasy. Tom, please, please, stop. I had an argument with one of those kids at the filling station. I don't know what they're doing. But stopping won't do any good. I mean, I haven't <laughs> tried it or anything, but I'm sure of it. Just try it, maybe? Maybe just try the thing that makes your family safe that your wife has suggested multiple times now. <laughs> As the two cars fly out onto the desert roads again, a second teen car, driven by their friend Joe, joins the fun in a black 56 Bel Air. The family's Plymouth Belvedere is quickly trapped between the two hot rodders, and he still refuses to slow down and let the cars pass. Peg is losing her shit in the passenger seat while Tom lays on the horn. <laughs> Instead, Tom tries to pass the Bel Air, but they keep him stuck where he is. Duke mentions that he has more friends en route. When did you come and find out? More cars come over the hill ahead of them, set for a head-on collision, but instead of steering away, Tom blasts right between them. Peg begs her husband to escape the four cars harassing them now, and he decides the solution is to try to outrun them. It's like, these are modified right. hot rods. You're not going to outrun them in your four-door family vehicle. His entire family crowds tightly around him in the car. They've all got hands on him, like they're giving him shoulder and arm massages, and they stare intently at his face. Like, Tina's face is literally like four inches away from her dad's just looking at him, looking at the side of his head. Duke announces more incoming friends. He's running! Yeah, right into Johnny Corey. What a bored fucking town. <laughs> Everyone's on call, desperate to harass any random car coming through. It feels like the screenwriter saw a kid rev his engine once and thought, they're all maniacs. Yeah. <laughs> Duke signals his friends to block the road right ahead of Tom, but the cars just drive in random serpentine patterns and then roll around behind him again. <laughs> what are they even doing? Tom notes a sign advertising a picnic area one mile ahead. <laughs> one mile. Yep. It's only one mile away. Keep in mind, we're in the deepest, driest desert section of eastern California desert. <laughs> and Tom takes a 90 degree turn at 60 miles an hour, <laughs> blasting over a dirt ridge and swerving out into the picnic area. The teens all wait at the road for the family to return. We cut to the picnic area and it looks like Griffith Park. It's all yeah. green grass and big trees and a massive lake. A completely different biome from where we just saw Tom smash his family's heads against the ceiling of a car by jumping a sand dune at 10 over the speed limit. The family takes a moment to catch their breaths after all the excitement. What did they want? What did we do to them? Boy, I sure thought we were goners. They could have killed us. Completely out of nowhere, we are party to an argument between an older married couple arguing about who forgot to bring lunch. <laughs> no idea <laughs> yeah. why we're seeing this or why it happens. I guess these people were just like, can we be in a movie? Maybe they won an auction or something. Well, and it's like they unpack a cooler, but it's not a cooler. It's just a mini fridge. Yeah, it's a little fridge. And they open it up and it's just empty. It's like, yeah. wah, wah. It's like, I remember bringing a suspiciously light refrigerator along this trip. <laughs> After the Phillips family eat their lunch, Jamie finds another kid to toss around a football with. This other kid, by the way, is wearing a rainbow paisley button-up shirt and a green cap with a bright yellow ostrich feather tucked into it. <laughs> he looks like Peter Pan had a baby with blues traveling. I was like, I was like, <laughs> I thought this was like the artful Dodger. Yeah, what is happening? <laughs> Where are we? I'm going to show you my friend Fagin over here. He drives crazy. Tom and Peg tell Tina to do something to get away from them. And then they all worry aloud that these teen drivers might be future classmates of hers. Suddenly, a car blasts through the picnic area, and Jamie's new friend says it's his dad, leaving to buy him a hot dog from a stand across the lake. Uh, when they're talking about, like, I'm sure they go to a different school, they're like, there can't be that many schools. There's only one hotel. <laughs> Why is there multiple schools here? Yeah, they're definitely for sure going to be in the same school. But yeah. it, didn't they say that this place was, like, 50 miles away still? Yeah. So, like... Why would they be all the way out here? Why are they all the way out here at this gas station or random stretch of road mm. or picnic lake that's so far away from where they actually presumably live, which would be in Mayville? Because that's where Mayville keeps the fuck rocks. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know. The kids accidentally kick their football to Tom, and he hurts his back catching it. Dad lays down on a park bench, and Tina sits on a dock with her feet in the water. We cut to the Corvette creeping down the shady path to the picnic area. Duke's plan is to hit on Tina while they're here, and he tells Ernie to keep Gloria in the car. She is understandably upset. She comes up with a plan to violently make out with Ernie. Man, you are nuts. Duke's my best friend. Duke finds Tina on the dock and grabs her very suddenly. Duke is nobody's friend. <laughs> if Duke was an ice cream flavor, he'd be pralines and dick. <laughs> Duke finds Tina on the dock and grabs her very suddenly. She's terrified at first and asks why he and his friends terrorized her family today. He says it was funny and he thinks she's hot. <laughs> he doesn't really come up with any other reason than that. It's like, come on, it was great. It was great that I did that. He forces a kiss on her and she begs him to stop. I don't want to see you again ever. Duke mentions some vague agreement he had with Daly, the former owner of the motel, and demands that his father uphold it. The dad who left in a hurry to buy snacks returns driving just as dangerously, but this time he's followed by a highway patrol vehicle. The dad offers the cop a drink to calm him down. 68 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone, making a left turn without a signal, and not coming to a full stop at a stop sign. I call that bad driving, mister. I've been driving bad for 24 years, my friend. I haven't had a ticket yet. And what do you call that? Huh? I call that lucky. The cop breaks the man's streak. Mister, we run into brave guys like you every day in the week. They're always brave until they hit somebody. People have been running away from you for 24 years. Why don't you quit pressing their luck? As the cop tries to leave, Tom asks if there were any teens hanging out by the entrance, and he reports the bright red car that had harassed him all day. The cop compares the hot rods the kids drive around to guns and agrees it's only a matter of time before something terrible happens. Nowadays, they just have guns. <laughs> they can't afford cars. The cop says if Tom intends to file a report, he can come to the local highway patrol headquarters in Coleman, 30 miles west of Mayville. It's like, can't I just give you my report? <laughs> so that's, that's 80 miles away then? Thank you. Perfect. I'll drive 80 miles to Coleman. Because they're traveling west. Right. So it's 50 miles to Mayville, or Mayfield, or whatever. Mayville. Uh, and then another 30 miles to Coleman. Yep. yep, perfect. When Tina returns, she is worried on behalf of the boys to learn that her dad just told the police about the car. Now we cut to Mayville, where a mailman strikes up a conversation with Daly about him selling the hotel. Daly blames the worsening summer heat. It sounds like Daly was essentially a known swinger and hosted swinger parties at his desert hotel, which sort of explains why Duke and Ernie are so terrified to see the place change hands. Right on cue, the Corvette pulls up, and the kids ask if the rumors are true. In an effort to make Duke jealous, Gloria asks if Daly wouldn't like to bring her along to his new town and show her the sights. I always travel light, honey. No excess baggage. We cut to the big blinking arena sign on the front of the diner attached to Daly's motel, which was actually Billingsley's Steak Ranch, located right off the 101 in Calabasas until it was demolished in 1975. It was actually in the same parking lot as the Taco Bell at the Las Virgenes exit. Mm. So the parking lot that, that they're in in, mm -hmm. in between the diner and the, and the hotel mm -hmm. is, is actually that same parking lot. Oh. A band performs on stage at Daly's place. Daly does some walking around and flirts with a lady at the bar. You lost a couple of pounds, Hazel. I didn't lose them. I just shifted them around where they do the most good. Didn't think I'd remember, <laughs> huh? <laughs> The Phillips family arrive and Daly offers to show them to their rooms. The patrolman arrives and enters the diner. It looks like he's here to bust people for underage drinking but can't prove anything and leaves. Yeah, so they get Daly's room, which I guess is like the manager's office suite. Yeah. But it's like... Where's Daly going to sleep tonight? Well, well, he said he's going to sleep in one of the rooms. But at the same time, it's just like, yeah, I'm going to need this place like really scrubbed down. <laughs> yeah. Like, given what his lifestyle was... <laughs> Like, well, they don't know anything about his lifestyle. Yeah, but... Bill claims to have done all the research. Because they don't have anything. So, like, there are sheets on the bed. Whose yeah. sheets are those? Theirs now. Oh. They come with the place. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> the racer teens show up, and Duke follows Tina off toward the motel over Gloria's protestations. You think every girl's the same? No, I don't. Their names are different. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, Little Darlings when he's like, Oh, girls are sexy to me. <laughs> Gloria drags Ernie away across the parking lot. Tina lays in her bed having silent, hands-free orgasms as she listens to the music from the band at the neighboring diner. This is the last place that I would want the manager's like suite to be like right next yeah. door to the bar. That would be terrible. It should be on the other side of the building. Yeah. yeah. 
where Duke sits at a table by the door with what looks like a mouthful of Warhead candies. Tina works up the courage to watch the club from across the lot and then turns to swap her jammies for an evening dress and then climbs out the window, even though we just established that the door is functional and unlocked. I don't know why she climbed out the window other than to establish she's not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> Daly notices Duke is bummed out and starts hassling him when Duke threatens to date the daughter of the new owners. Daly tells him teens like him are the reason he's leaving town. Duke notices Tina enter the club and Gloria tries to intercept her before Duke can get to her. Duke and I have a thing going. Can you understand that? I don't believe you. Duke told me that. That's right, kid. You tell her. Ernie brings Gloria a drink and she's so enraged that she winds up to throw it at Duke but ends up spilling most of it on herself before running out of the place. Tina quickly realizes that Duke lied about Gloria being Ernie's girl the whole time. He drags her to the dance floor anyway and she's quickly enjoying herself. Back at the motel around 1.15 a.m., the sound of a shattering glass wakes Tina's whole family. Jamie rats out on his sister for being gone from her room and Dad gets dressed to find her. Duke invites her outside for a chat and Dad starts the search for his daughter. He overhears a boy and girl laughing in a hotel room and knocks hard on the door, which is a bad start for the new owner of a motel to be interrupting customer sex looking for his children. Yeah, but I don't think that these people are paying for the room. <laughs> well, that's what confuses me. How did they get in here? Like... What, how do you even charge for rooms at a motel if all the doors are unlocked and people could just go in and sleep? Bizarrely, Ernie and Gloria are in the room and they slam the door in his face, suggesting they spent money renting a hotel room in their own town. Tom turns around to look for Tina. Gloria chases him down, afraid he will tell on them. For what, I have no idea. Wait! Wait! Please wait! Wait! You're not going to tell anybody. What would you care? She tells Tom that he's not the great father he thinks he is and points out where he could find Tina and Duke hanging out together. Tom searches the diner club place. I don't know what to call this. Well, they called it a coffee shop. It looks like an IHOP <laughs> with a dance floor. <laughs> like, I don't know what you would call this. But uh, he checks there and he doesn't find her inside. He tells Daly why he's here, though. Duke is trying to force himself on Tina outside and she is repeatedly asking him to back off. You trying to tell me you don't like this? Oh, come on, relax. You know, it's what's happening around here. You want to get in with the kids, don't you? I don't know. I, I don't want it to be like this. Hey, just don't play games with me. You understand that? Tom finds Duke and wrestles him off Tina. He wraps his hands around the boy's neck, but hurts his own back in the process and has to let the kid go. Yeah, you gotta lift with your knees. Yeah. When you strangle people to death. Daly shows up to the end of the fight and Tom communicates his complete ignorance of contract law. A deal is off then. We're already an escrow pal. The deal isn't off just because you're too feeble to strangle children. <laughs> Tom thinks he has a case against Daly because this unrelated kid got handsy with his daughter. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Daly tosses Duke into his car and Gloria begs Daly to take her with him again and he has to shove her off to get away from her. Ernie comes to her defense and gets a fist in the face. Now Duke comes at him, and Daly grabs a shovel, and I was really hoping we'd get some arterial spray in this scene. <laughs> I, I don't understand why no one goes after the cars. Like, one one time we do some damage to the car, but that's it. Yeah, it, it's just like, Daly, you want to you wanna show a force? Th toss that shovel through the goddamn windshield. Yeah, and th there's, there's another th thing I wish went through this windshield later, but we'll come to that. <laughs> I've seen you grow up, and I don't want to see any more, because the more you grow, the worse you get. The hell isn't going to burn out of you. It's just going to get hotter, even hotter than the sun gets around here. He officially sends the kids off his trail when he tells them that Tom Phillips is going to the cops immediately to press charges against a lot of them. That guy Phillips is clearing out of here tonight, and you know the first place he's going is police headquarters in Coleman. He's going to get the cops down on this place, but I'm not going to be here, because he owns it whether he likes it or not. Daly leaves them with this info, and Duke makes another terrible plan. He isn't going to reach Coleman, Ernie, because we're going to see that he doesn't. In the hotel room, Peg massages Tom's back, and Tina aggressively defends Duke's hotness for some reason. Any girl would want Duke. Tina, so help me. Do you want me to lie? No, just shut up about your crush on the guy that's been trying to kill us for two days. Dad storms out, and Tina continues her streak of needless honesty. Tina, how far would you have gone with Duke? I don't know. It, it didn't seem wrong to me then. I, I don't know. And if it should happen again... The scene takes a sudden crazy turn from here. Mom is suddenly calling Tina a slut. Is that what you want? To wind up in a motel room with any man? 
Then, suddenly Tina is complaining that her mom is pressuring her to get married, which didn't seem like the point of the conversation, but she's terrified that her future husband might be a disappointment. All you think about is me getting married! What if something happens to the man I married? What if he gets to be like, Dad? Oh. Slap! Tina is mostly worried about her reputation in town now that her dad went crazy and tried to strangle Duke. Mom tells her not to be embarrassed because literally every woman is desperate to get married and lesbians don't exist. <laughs> Tina, there isn't a woman alive who doesn't want a man. Yeah, I, I, I was like, really? No woman? <laughs> she tells Tina she is too hot to settle for losers. Tom calls his brother Bill to announce the deal is off, and he's just out tens of thousands of dollars. Sorry. <laughs> Also, we're coming to your place tonight, so straight up abandoning the hotel you bought yeah. us. <laughs> Nobody's going to pay for anything. They'll probably destroy it. Uh, good luck. Bill warns him that the roads are dark and dangerous, but Tom is desperate. Later, we see them driving, and they come to a police roadblock at the scene of a terrible accident. The same patrolman from before says he thought they were headed to Mayville, but Tom says they changed their mind. He's being weirdly secretive about it, too. He's like, yeah. oh, uh, officer, um, uh, we decided against Mayville. <laughs> it's like, how about just be like, fuck your stupid town. Yeah. I hated it. Now, I thought for sure the implication here was that Duke had run the wrong car off the road. That's what I thought, too, yeah. Yeah. But it as seemed... soon as we come up to the accident, I'm like, they tried to stop somebody from getting to Coleman, and they, they stopped the wrong people. We see the kid from the picnic area crying and his mother, and eventually we learn that the shitty driver dad had a run-in with some hot rodder kids out here and rolled his car, dying in the process. Uh, well, before we see the kid who's alive, right. we see his hat on yeah. the ground. Yeah. And I was like, oh, oh no. I thought it went real dark. <laughs> yeah. That would have that been better, actually. <laughs> it was like, I, wondered, I was wondering why he was wearing such a unique and identifiable hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they tried a few different hats and they were like, people aren't going to get it. It needs to look so fucking crazy that literally no one would ever wear this hat. <laughs> Jamie asks if dad's accident looked something like this and he reckoned it did. <laughs> Complete with a Peter Pan hat. <laughs> like, why are you wearing that, dad? It seems like, despite Daly's warning, Tom has no plans to report the kids. He just wants out of the land deal. Suddenly, Peg realizes that her husband is being lame by not continuing to fight with the kids. Are you giving up? You've been wanting to ask me that ever since I called Bill, haven't you? And right on cue, the kids come flying down the road after them. But somehow Peg doesn't suspect a thing. Funny how good it is just to know there's another car. <laughs> Boy, sure coming fast. <laughs> Seriously? How do you guys not know what's happening right now? They still don't realize it's Duke until he flies past them. Tom confesses to Peg that he might have threatened to call the police, and that might be why the kids are trying to murder them again. Again, Peg suggests the life-saving option of just stopping, but Tom is all worked up to race against these kids and prove his manlyhood. Maybe we'd better stop. Uh, that might be exactly what they're counting on. You better keep moving. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't understand. They they want you to stop so they can just have a civil conversation on the side of the road? Is that what you're suggesting? Duke comes back for a round of chicken and Tom waits till the last second to swerve out of the way in his car full of unseat belted children. <laughs> Why are you doing this to your family, sir? Tom, please stop the car. What do they do then, Peg? Do you know? We take a chance to find out they're crazy, don't you know that? You're right. Let's keep doing this. This is working out great. <laughs> we should have seen these kids physically attack Tom one time. Duke didn't even fight back when Tom was strangling him. What is he so afraid of when they're all out of their cars? Tom loses another game of chicken. They see a sign for a truck stop called Haven's Diner down the road. Tom, hurry, let's get there quick. He pulls back onto the road and proceeds to drive 20 miles an hour with zero sense of urgency to their destination. Tina is relieved, even though literally nothing is over. How about that? Everything's gonna be okay. But pulling over at a truck stop is negligibly different from pulling over at the side of the road like Peg has been suggesting for miles. When they get there, they find Haven's Diner is all boarded up. But Tom tries to break into the place, insisting there's a working phone inside. I feel like it's pretty customary to shut off the phones at a location when you close it down. Yeah. But maybe the 60s were different than today? I bet they were, in some ways. Tina is amazingly still upset at her dad's plan to call the police on their attempted murderers. Tina, he has to do it. Can you understand that? I do understand, Mother. I told you I'm not a baby anymore. No. No, you're not. 
Tom busts open the window in the door to unlock it and slices open his hand real good. Inside, Tom finds the phone is not only dead, but the cords have been cut. But this dramatic insert almost implies it was done nefariously, but the place was boarded up, so yeah. they clearly yeah. did this on their way out, like the previous owners did this. Duke and Ernie pull up and catch Tom in their headlights as he exits the place. Well, and see, I, I don't think that that's proper procedure either. It would be to Cutting cut the, the line? Well, because um, cause I still think you can, even without a phone line, you think you can still dial for emergency services. Not anymore. <laughs> we sliced up the know. wires. It seems like that would, like, even if you're not paying for a phone service, you should be able to call 911. Maybe. You think that's why he was trying to get in there? But 911 wasn't invented until oh, that's the true. 80s. That's true. But you should be able to dial it. Or at least dial the an number operator. Should still dial be there. an operator. I mean, in theory, you at a certain point, like you, you were able to ask to charge the other person mm-hmm. on the other end of the phone for a call. I mean, not like a collect call per se, but like, I think that you could do that. When they first started nine one one, it must have been really frustrating because people were like, "I used to just dial O in an emergency. Why did you triple the number of buttons <laughs> I have to press and make them so specific? <laughs> like they're not even near each other." Yeah. So people still pressed O for probably a couple years, and the operators were all pissy about it. Like, you know, we have a number for this now. I'll connect you, but really shouldn't be using this. Why don't you just make it press O three times? Whatever. You're going to be a computer in a year anyway, lady. If you are currently on fire, press one. (laughs) You have selected regicide. If you know the name of the king or queen being murdered, press one. (laughs) Duke and Ernie pull up and catch Tom in their headlights as he exits the place. Tom picks up a board and invites the teens to fight. See the nails in this? <laughs> Don't you give me a chance. I'd like to see if you can laugh with these nails in your face. It's like there's a lot of harder things out here that you could have thrown at the car that would have legitimately pissed them off, but you have this wooden board that's the least likely to do anything to them. Duke starts idling toward Tom as if he planned to pin him against the outside of the closed diner, but Tom could also just go inside and be fine. There would be no threat to him if he went inside because these kids aren't superheroes and they can't fight back if they don't have a car. Peg runs out to protect her husband as he tosses the board at the car and the kids drive away, but I think he does shatter a headlight or something Mm. because it bounces off the car and you hear glass breaking. Tom insists they continue on to the police station in Coleman despite all these threats or perhaps because of them. They're back on the road for five seconds, and you'll never guess what happened. Dad works up a plan. He tells everybody to get out of the car so they can hide in the bushes off the road. He leaves his car in the middle of the street with its lights on. A minute later, when Duke and Ernie return, they start a game of chicken with the empty car and realize too late there's nobody in it. And when they swerve at the last second, declaring themselves chicken, they flip their car end over end into the dirt. And there's like two dummies in this convertible that just get smashed on their heads. They clearly died if this was people in the car. Tom rushes up to the overturned car with a tire iron, ready to fuck these kids up more. (laughs) But then he turns his aggression on the car when he sees how hurt they are. Uh, And he barely, like whales in the car yeah there's no "Eh, sound either eh, (laughs) my back Uh. (laughs) he laughs at the bloody teens because he realizes that he could have won all the previous games of chicken if he just stuck to his guns but that's not how chicken works (laughs) i would have won all those games of chicken if i didn't lose them (laughs) yes you're correct technically it would it would have been like that scene in last action hero yeah when he's in the real world and they're playing chicken yeah people don't people don't actually swerve at chicken they just crash (laughs) yeah airbags Can you believe it? (laughs) He promises to return to Mayville to clean up the hotel and all of its debauchery and underage drinking, and the police need not be involved. Right on cue, the same highway patrolman pulls up, and Tom corroborates the teen story that their brakes went out, and he was just here to help. Hey, didn't you tell me something about a red car today? This, uh, this doesn't look like the one. He announces to the patrolman that he and his family have decided to stay in Mayville after all, as if this guy cares. Yeah. (laughs) His plan, though, is terrible. So you're going to go back and take the one thing that this town has going for it that people actually like and pay money for Mm -hmm. and destroy what they like about it so they'll never come back. My brother Bill bought me this financially stable business out in the desert. I'm just going to fucking run into the ground. (laughs) Well, again, this is what this movie is about, is about having the moral high ground. And he's like, I'm going to clean it up and it's going to be a better place once I get rid of all you lousy teens. It's not going to make any money. Yeah. 
Tom makes Peg drive them home, and we dissolve to blue for credits. <laughs> so that's Hot Rods <laughs> from Hell, or Hot Rods to Hell, sorry. Yeah. From Hell is the prequel. So the only person who actually dies as the result of a car crash. Is the asshole dad. Yeah. And and really, I didn't care about him to begin with. I wanted one of these smug teens to eat it. I also think it would have been useful. Yeah, Ernie could have died in that last accident. Why did they both survive? Yeah. Like, you could still make a deal with the surviving teen if, if Ernie's head is there in the dirt. <laughs> That'd be a little dark, though. <laughs> I mean, to me, it would have made most sense to have Gloria die. Uh, then Tina to would fly have, off the top of the car. Well, because then Tina would have seen what being the girl of of this guy would really mean. Sure. This is what happens to all of Duke's girlfriends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, again, that's in the spirit of the PSA propaganda yeah. See, on nature. the other side, I, I think if, if the dad had survived the accident and his you know, Prince of Thieves' son had died, that, that would be like, because then you see this guy going like, oh, that guy told me earlier today that I've been driving like a monster and I was going to kill somebody and now I killed my own son. Mm. That's pretty heavy well, to I'm, drop on people. Or at least go like some like death proof with this or something yeah. like just how ha- I, I feel like it needed to escalate more somebody needed to lose a limb or something yeah, yeah. we needed one rubbery <laughs> leg to go flying yes. through the air <laughs> I, I thought when they kept saying like you know like they do can do whatever he wants i was like oh man is his dad like the sheriff or don't insult the dick yeah I, I, I thought for sure there was going to be some kind of twist about his family but they're just they're just bored teens. Yeah. I mean, they do. The Charlie says that they're rich. So yeah. they, they come from money and they can do what they want. But why, if they're rich, why are they living in this shit town? Well, they're, they're desert rich. <laughs> <laughs> They've made a fortune in turquoise. Yeah. This is a thumbs down for me, though. <laughs> this, this is not really worth watching, I don't think. It has some fun performances, but it's not for me. It, it was a relief for me for me that it wasn't three hours and nineteen minutes. <laughs> yeah, when it ended, and you were like, "Oh, okay, good. This isn't Heaven's Gate if it were a slow '60s PSA." <laughs> but I but I definitely feel tricked uh, when with that radio announcement about the epic climbing death toll, and I was yeah. like, "What is happening in this movie?" Wasn't There's one there post credit scene to that news announcement. I feel like they were talking about people driving recklessly because yeah, of speed yeah. I, I think it was like a, a countrywide epidemic of hot rodders, basically. Yeah. Like so I think I think they did say something that accounted for the deaths, mm-hmm. and it was car related. But for some reason, Mayville has only had one victim so far because yeah. it doesn't seem like this is like. A recurring thing. The and, cops would have been would have mentioned that they they have been killing people all over the place. Yeah, and it and it was just it wasn't even a local, right? It was just someone passing through town. Well, I think it. I think they're local. You think? He knows where the hot dog stand is around the lake. Mm. It's just because he drives so fast. Well, and and he says he's been doing this for whatever twenty five years, and yeah, so twenty four years. But then whatever. you think he would have had a run in with. This particular cop? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe the, the cops just got their cars upgraded and they couldn't catch up with them before. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I don't think this would be a recommend for uh, for <laughs> me, for anyone. But, you know, it's it's amusing in its badness. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the best performance for me is Gloria because she's just so, like, adrenaline junkie and and wanting like murder to happen in front of her like, yeah because that that's the only thing that keeps her going is maybe i'll see some horrifying death today but i also that, like peg flipping out at the drop of a hat just like oh my god they're after us <laughs> and when they're all just like <laughs> clutching the dad as he's yeah. driving like it just hands all over yeah. him. it's like what is happening Oh my gosh! And and the whole thing is that he's super stressed to be behind the wheel, but they're screaming in his ear. <laughs> yeah, I think they're gonna kill us. But my favorite moment was definitely when she's like, "Man, it feels good to hear another car on the road." <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> nice relaxing drive again. <laughs> oh shit, it's the guys! <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a thumbs down from me. Yeah. Our director here was John Brom. He directed 12 Twilight Zones, most notably season one, episode eight, Time Enough at Last, with Burgess Meredith breaking his glasses. Spoiler alert. The writer here was Robert E. Kent. That's the screenplay credit. Uh, He has credits dating back to the 30s. He has a Charlie Chan movie, a Dick Tracy movie, I think a couple Dick Tracy movies, a Philo Vance movie. His final writing credit was for the Christine Jorgensen story. Do you guys recall the last time we brought up the Christine Jorgensen story? Miracle Hands. No. <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, the Christine Jorgensen story is a film. 
and there was a poster for it in Mr. Fishpaw's office in Polyester. The story credit goes to Alex Gaby, who also has a story credit on an Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Those were the only two credits on their IMDb page. The music here is from Fred Carger. He has lots of composer credits that I mostly didn't recognize, but his last one was for Chatterbox in 77, wherein a woman's vagina gains the ability to talk. Oh. I'm pretty sure the DP on that is Tak Fujimoto. We've brought it up on the show before. <laughs> is uh, there one where it's a mouth? Yeah, teeth. it's called Teeth. Yeah. It's a good double feature, probably, Chatterbox and Teeth. <laughs> Cinematographer here was, sorry. I was going to say Chatterbox was also, like, the name of the Cinnabite from Hellraiser that is just, like, a big teeth just clacking back yeah. and forth. The cinematographer here was Lloyd Ahern Sr. He was a DP on the Brasher Doubloon, an early and not great Philip Marlowe adaptation. He also lit Miracle on 34th Street and mostly TV credits after the 50s, with a few exceptions like this one. The editor here was Ben Lewis. He has edit credits dating back to 26, including the original Tarzan the Ape Man adaptation, which we discussed in our review of the 1981 remake. Dana Andrews played Tom Phillips. He was Detective McPherson in Laura. He was Sergeant Tyne in A Walk in the Sun. Fred Derry in The Best Years of Our Lives. And he's also Ted Stryker in Zero Hour, a role reprised by Robert Hayes in Airplane last season. Jean Crane played Peg Phillips. This was her fourth appearance as the wife of Dana Andrews after State Fair, Duel in the Jungle, and Madison Avenue. She's also Deborah Bishop in A Letter to Three Wives, Peggy in Apartment for Peggy, and Pinky in Pinky. Mimsy Farmer played Gloria. That's a cool name, Mimsy Farmer. Uh, she has art department credits on recent films like Pirates of the Caribbean, On Stranger Tides, and Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Laura Mock played Tina Phillips. Not many credits I recognize, though. The same year, she and Mimsy Farmer basically traded good girl, bad girl roles for another film, Riot on the Sunset Strip. Paul Bertoya played Duke. Not much else I recognized. Gene Kirkwood played Ernie. He also shows up in Riot on the Sunset Strip. He transitioned to producing, starting with Rocky and then New York, New York. So far, we've seen his work on The Idolmaker, and later he produces The Keep and UHF. Jeffrey Byron played Jamie Phillips. He is the test administrator in Abrams' Star Trek, so maybe the Kobayashi Maru, like uh, the guy that's, yeah, that's the operating that machine. Of, yeah. uh, he's also Philip Tillinghast in several Lovecraftian direct-to-video releases, The Resonator Miskatonic U, Beyond the Resonator, and Curse of Reanimator. He's also Dogen in Metal Storm the Destruction of Jared Sin. George Ives played Lank Daly. <laughs> Lank. That's a cool first name. <laughs> uh, not many credits I recognize outside of this until 2001 when he showed up as Lloyd Garraway in the Coens' The Man Who Wasn't There, and then he reunited with the Coens as Mrs. Gutman's lawyer in Intolerable Cruelty. William Mims played Man at Picnic. That's the only casualty of the film. We've seen him now as the Brown Corniche owner in Underground Aces and Jensen in The Ballad of Cable Hogue. Paul Genge played the policeman. He was Mike the Hitman in Bullet. Harry Hickox played Uncle Bill Phillips. He was Charlie Cowell in The Music Man and the police chief in The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. Mickey Rooney Jr. was the combo leader. That was the lead performer of the band okay. at the arena place. He is the son of Jimmy Stewart. No, I'm just kidding. He's the son of Mickey Rooney. Uh, we saw him last in Honeysuckle Rose as Cotton Roberts, the other musician on tour with Willie Nelson and Amy Irving. He does not appear in Riot on the Sunset Strip, but his brother, Tim Rooney, another of Mickey Rooney's kids, does. Stuart Nisbet played Surgeon. I am Stuart Nisbet. <laughs> the, the, the hat worked. <laughs> Tell me the hat worked. <laughs> he played Shuey in In the Heat of the Night. Liz Renee played Hazel. She was Muffy St. Jacques in John Waters' Desperate Living. Christopher Reardon played Student. We saw him last as Young Suspect in Night Moves. Arthur Tovey played Man Seated at Bar. He was Wilbur in Back to the Future, whoever that is. Who's Wilbur? I don't know. I Uncredited mean... Wilbur. Probably one of the bullies. He was a Vulcan citizen on Earth in Star Trek TMP, and we saw him last as Government Official in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. I think that's everything for Hot Rods to Hell. Thanks again to VJ Boyd for their generous contribution to the show. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing whatever you chose. We leave you now with a trailer for Hot Rods to Hell. Thank
kids will try anything for kicks. A hopped up car. An innocent girl. I, I don't want it to be like this. Hey, just don't play games with me. And maybe even murder. Just stand there, chicken. Don't move. <laughs> They call him Duke, and he uses girls the same way he uses cars, for kicks. Get lost, Ernie. You think you can handle them? You're just a kid. You think I've never kissed a boy before? Is that what you want, to wind up in a motel room with any man? All you think about is me getting married. What if something happens to the man I married? What if he gets to be like Dad? Oh. They're trying to kill us, Peg. I've got to do business on their terms. Not fast! No limit. No limit. No limit. Run him off the road, Duke! Run him off the road! <laughs> Day and night, night and day, these kids will try anything for kicks. 